Okay, so last time we went through almost all of chapter two, we talked about vocabulary, talked about error and accuracy, talked about parametric and non-parametric models, uh, talked a bunch about the trade-off between accuracy and interpretable models, and then that's continued to play out in the, the chat um, over the last week. Um, barely mentioned supervised versus unsupervised. Talked about regression versus classification, barely. Um, talked about accuracy and goodness. Um, why is that twice? Oh, and regression and classification. And then we had just gotten to describing bias and variance. Um, so um, anybody want to pick up on, on anything that, that's been talked about in the chat over the, the, the week? I think it was one of the Ryans had up some some really cool, or started a cool conversation. I don't know if that Ryan is here. No? Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know if we, maybe we could save it to the end or something. It was really just an observation about, um, about, uh, w about models being built for interpretability or for prediction benefit and trying to balance those two, those two different concepts. Um, but anyway, maybe, maybe if there's time we can revisit that. I don't want to take take too much time away from what the, the plan is. Sounds good. The, I don't know, I thought it was a, a great question and it's it's some, something that I deal with all the time is with, I, I do biomedical stuff. And so like, I need the right answer or the best possible answer and trying to negotiate between trying to come up with the optimal model versus a model that I can interpret is like a big deal in my world. All right, um, so these are all the things I talked about. I think um, I didn't have time to review the review the recording. Uh, I think that we got through accuracy. Anybody, anybody recall where, which number I left off on? No, I don't. I should have checked that before we uh, started. I'm sorry about that. Oh, good. Uh, no, I did get through this. Uh, I did talk about binds. Eh, we'll go here just because <laughs> it's complicated and I'm not even sure. So um, in this section, the authors talked about um, what goes into the mistakes that models make. So there is um, bias. So uh, this part. So you have some predictive function to predict your out. So your outcome, sorry, the measurement on the error, the expectation of the error is like each person minus their prediction um, and it's squared. And that is made of bias, which is just flat out error in the model, plus the amount of variability that is inherent to the model, plus some leftover error that you can't touch. So the bias was like, um, if the data is actually well described by a curve by parabola, if you try and put a straight line through it, your model's not going to be hot. It's going to be biased. Then there's variance, which is if you were to try the same technique over and over and over again on different resamples of the data, there's variability across the samples in your estimate in your estimates. So you get it's like the variability based on the technique, the inaccuracy based on the technique, plus the unreducible error left over at the end. I thought this was, I, don't know, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I, think, they talk um, I was just going to say, I think putting it kind of in terms of, um, you know, straight line versus super curvy line, like the, the highest bias or, or, I don't know, the highest reasonable bias is going to be when you just put your straight line through your points. And yeah, okay, um, maybe that same model will work for every data set, but it's not a very good model. It's, you know, way off versus variance where you're just putting the curvy line through every point where, okay, that's going to be perfect for that set of data. Um, so low variance, or sorry, low bias, but it's only going to work for that one set of data. So it's the high variance. So I just think, you know, thinking in the curves is really helpful there. Totally. That's exactly where my head is at. 
the um, they showed these curves, which again still make my head hurt. Um, where as you add flexibility, um, you potentially are reducing bias if the data does need a curve or does need flexibility. But at some point you put in so much flexibility that the data won't be, behave well on a new data set. And the bias variance trade-off really comes down to picking the right amount of wiggliness. And that will depend on the underlying actual pattern in the data. And you don't know what that is. So again, this, this, the quote down here, the, the goal is to find the optimal variance, optimal minimal variance and optimal minimal squared bias. Um, and the book is about that. Then, so everything up to this point was all about um, making predictions on continuous outcomes. They briefly talk about categorical outcomes. I just found this kind of funny because it's like, okay, here's an equation. And all it's really saying is, did you get guess the correct answer? <laughs> so, you know, add up the, or calculate the percentage of times you guessed the, the answer correctly. Um, they talk a couple of times or, or repeat the idea um, that you don't really care about the performance on the training data. What you really care about is performance on a new data set. So that might be um, if you sliced out part of the data and set it aside for testing or on just new, gen truly new data is what you actually care about. Um, so they quantify accuracy as being a metric useful for categorical data. Okay, so classification, um, they talked about um, testing error. So this is again, effectively it's the percentage of time that you guess the correct answer. Not really complicated. They talked about the Bayes classifier, which is um, your, um, <laughs> you should always guess the best guess so choose the most likely answer for a person based off of the prediction is what I, I got from that. So it's a conditional probability where you say, you guess your why based on the pattern of the predictors. <laughs> then they got into, um, they walked through an example of actually doing a classification where you've got the blues and the yellows the, um, the Bayes decision boundary is the purple line, whereas your best guess, where you actually know. So at this line, you just don't know um, if a person is in one group or another. So it's a 50% probability of being on either side of the line. Um, notice in the sample data, you can't make per um, perfect predictions. Well, like, getting this guy yellow is gonna be seriously difficult because he's clustered around, he's surrounded by other blue guys. Anyway, so the idea is there is a decision space where you're trying to divide people into two groups. Um, the Bayes error rate, that's like the, the lowest possible error that you can do, again, based off of the expectation. Um, so it's the best possible performance you can get. And your goal, your goal is to try and come up with the, the purple line or the best way to define the two data sets or the two subgroups. All right, then there's a quick walkthrough on K nearest neighbors. Idea being you pick a point and then you choose some number of data points around it to um, make the classification. So in this case, with a K of three, um, two out of the three closest people are in the blue group. And so you, you call this person blue and they lay out the idea of you come up with a decision boundary based off of that rule. Um, can't remember what else were the key points with this um, other than it is a method for trying to do classification. And they didn't talk about, they didn't, I don't think they use the word tuning, but 
um, they, they were describing the idea of you can tune, you can try different Ks, and with each K you try, you're gonna get slightly different sets of, or different sets of classifications. And they show you get different amounts of jagginess, jaggedness, um, depending on what you set the K at, K as. So if you set it to one, it's crazy jagged. If you set it to 100, it's, it's super smooth. Um, so can we understand the K here as like the parameter that dials the flexibility of the model? bringing us between the bias and the variance, you know, like that, that axis there in the other plots. I should think so. Yeah, that sounds right. What's everybody else think? Yeah, and I think it's even in, like the positive direction is flexibility, or uh, sorry, is it's the other way. It's so- okay, Smaller K is more flexible, right? Yeah, right. Um, more likely to only work for this one data set. Yeah, and in that I, I always like to think in the extremes, if you go to K is one, you're simply getting the closest person um, and you're completely in trouble if there's any errors in the data. And then the other extreme is you go out to K is equal to N. So then every single person is put into the majority class. So if K is N, you just say, what's the probability across everybody and put everybody into that bin. And so you go from ridiculously um, flexible with K is one and ridiculously not flexible, which is K is equal to N. Um, and then I, I think of this as being tuning. I don't think they called it that, but the idea is as the K um, goes up, you get closer and closer to perfect prediction in the training data, but you put too much jaggedness in. And so you end up with more and more testing error. And so that's it's the, the U or bathtub shaped curve that they showed before. So it's, as one over K goes up, it looks like yeah, they got the inverse. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But same idea where you do better and better and better on the training data as you add more and more flexibility, but you eventually will have overfit the data um, and you will do less well on the test data. So that's my notes. Thank you very, very much. These were uh, very helpful when I was looking at the exercises, being able to look at the notes versus, I mean, I was also going through the book, but, you know, having nice summary slides were, that was helpful. So thank you. Um, let's see. Let's see. There were a couple of questions. Um, I'm not sure which example we were looking at at the time, but how would you calculate bias in the example given? Um I'm sorry that I didn't notice that question when it came up. Does anyone want to chime in with what that's about? It's AS asked the question, or maybe we can look yeah. back at the slides. Oh, Hi, go ahead. Um, yeah, that, that was me. Uh, so this was about the, uh, the trade-off, the, what was that? The bias uh, variability trade-off. Variance. Yeah, so yeah. I guess their, their idea is that if you kind of optimize that equation, you try you find the best possible uh, method for that particular data set, right? So I was just thinking we we know how to calculate variance, but how do you calculate bias really? So I don't know. That totally makes make, sense. yeah. The, it's a perfect. It's a great question. It makes perfect sense, and I think the answer is you don't really know because you don't have the truth. Um, you try and guess it by sampling over and over again and looking at the performance. Um, you know, if, if you are fitting a polynomial, you know, just a single curve and you systematic and you see over and over again, how do I say this? So like if you're doing an ordinary least squares regression, you know, you get a scatter plot and you look at the, the residuals and you see over and over again that there's a, a U shape or a, an N shape 
in the date in the residuals you can see that you are over and over again um making mistakes and so that would give you a clue that that there's some bias um but it, you, you don't really know at the end of the day because we don't know what the truth is right I, yeah i guess uh, sort of makes sense what you said um i guess uh, yeah working out examples might uh might become you know that thing might become clearer i think so All right and then shamsadeen was asking about um validation sets which this chapter doesn't go into i think that's something that i assume they will introduce the term when we start getting into having cases where you know, the idea is you split off part of your training as like an internal test set while you're training versus the actual final golden test set um yeah they don't get into it so we'll probably talk about that later i think uh, it's in, it's either in chapter four or chapter five okay they talk they talk about <laughs> taking your taking your data and splitting it into into chunks so that you can find out how good you're doing as you're building models. And then you set another chunk aside to do like one final last check on. Right, okay. So yeah, we'll see that in the future. And yeah, K is the number of nearest neighbors. So that's another thing from the comments. Um, and then I think that's from what we were just discussing. Um, and yeah, so the, um, oops, the, just getting into like the actual definition of bias, that it, that can be confusing where it's like the error from truth, not the error from what we know of truth. And so like any data set that you look at is a, a subset of truth. And so I think that's where it can get kind of confusing of, but of course we can calculate bias. We just look at how far off we are. It's like, no, that's like accuracy. Um, bias is kind of wrapping all of that up. All right. Well, let's go ahead and see how this goes. I am going to just share the um, my screen with the, the book on it. Uh, there we go. And um, the idea is let's just start discussing through these and I've got some notes around here somewhere so uh, let me make sure I've got that handy oops that's work notes don't put that on screen all right um so uh yeah and like I said uh I did not as fully prepare for this as I planned to because I got sniped at work with an interesting question that I had to focus on all day um <laughs> but uh so just let's let's start going through and I, I like yeah there are kind of a lot of us but there are few enough of us that let's just kind of talk it out and let's try to just have a, a discussion and so feel free to chime in when you have a thought about any of this and please do chime in all right so the first question was asking about um flexible versus inflexible or what you know will a flexible method um be better or worse than an inf inflexible method and I think this was a good way to kind of think through some examples and really wrap our head around um, the meanings. Oops, there we go. That's not it. That's it. Okay. Um, so first we have an example where the sample size is extremely large. Number of predictions is small. Um, trying to get a screen up where I can see people. Does anyone have any thoughts about what that would be? I think you'd want a flexible model because you got a whole lot of data and you can pick out the real patterns in it. Right. It seems like That's... you have a high data density kind of. Yes. Um, yeah, like that one, it, so let me see where, how did I word that? Um, that basically it, that helps to make up for the, the variance side of the trade-off that you you've got a hopefully you know taking extremely large to mean um 
representative, you know, like right, right. <laughs> expected to be representative of the actual population um, versus uh, in the next one, we've got um, a lot of predictors, but not many observations. And so that one is just screaming um, overfitting that you're going to look at those predictors and say, oh, okay, I can predict this data set precisely if you go really flexible. But um, it's probably going to do worse than a less flexible method. And I do think it's just kind of an aside that, you know, is a flexible going to be better than an inflexible? Like it's a continuum. So, like, you know, at some point you're going to have the right trade off of flexible and inflexible. But for B, you probably want to move more to the, or I guess the side, the inflexible side. And for A, you want to move more to the flexible side. All right. Um, the relationship between predictors and response is highly nonlinear. Does anyone have any thoughts on that one? All right, well, flexible, kind of like what we were talking about with the, the kind of two extreme curves, you got your straight line versus your super wiggly line. Flexible, flexible is moving into your wiggly line. And if the true, um, you know, the true model is super wiggly, then you want something that can get super wiggly is kind yeah. of the way yeah, to look sense. at that. Um, and then finally, the variance of the error terms um, sigma squared equals uh, variance of epsilon is extremely high. Um, this one, I think, like, I think the first three were clear in the definitions. Like, it, um, it was really clear to me what the answer should be. This one was a little bit, uh, made me think a little bit more. So I would say this uh, flexible before would be you, worse. Yeah, I was going to say before you, we talked about that, Flexible and versus inflexible. Just want to like confirm I'm understanding correctly. So I'm saying the error term here. This is like the intrinsic error that like we can't touch to, to use the I think race terminology here. Yeah, the right? irreducible like, error. Yeah, and if that's really high, that means you know our our data is generally going to be noisy around even the true model. Right. Right. So it, it's funny because I don't know, it feels like you're unlikely to get a great model in any case if if it's super, you know, like basically if um, this kind of says to me, there are variables that we aren't able to collect or we're not collecting, whether we're right. able to right. or not. And so there are things that are important that we just don't know for each observation. So we would be really likely to overfit on that noise if we go too flexible. Yeah, so I just I, mean? yeah. I just interpret it as just like you're in trouble. <laughs> so if if there's a whole lot of unpredictable error, if there's a whole lot that just cannot be predicted, it really doesn't matter if you're using <laughs> a straight line or if you're using the craziest complicated model because it's just saying inherently you can't model truly random noise. Right. Like, um, I mean, and I think it the is, straight line is better. Like, I yeah. think, like they're both going to be bad, but one deceives you less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, you're going to be, you're going to continue to be wrong in the same way with the more inflexible or the less flexible method um, versus like you're overfitting to exact to your data because this data is you know has its own idiosyncrasies that your next data set's not going to have because you're not capturing something you know you so this one like i said it made me kind of think about it a lot more because it's well i think it's worse but i don't think it's as clear cut <laughs> all right anyone have any other thoughts on flexible versus inflexible um I think like this is, you know, like whatever. They, this is a lot of what the rest of the book is going to be about, I think, is trade-offs between methods. Okay. Um, 
And so, okay, now they're going to give us some situations and we figure out if it's classification or regression, um, whether we care more about inference or prediction, and then we provide N and P. Uh, so the first one is we're collecting a set of data on the top 500 firms in the U.S. and recording profit, number of employees, industry, and the CEO salary. And we want to uh, understand which factors affect CEO set salary. Um, Oh, hold on. We've got all kinds of stuff happening in the chat. Uh, I think that's for the, yeah, for that last bit. Everyone feel free to speak up. Um, so uh, there was a question of, would you be able to wrangle the data or clean the data more if it's noise, likely not? Right. So I take this as this situation is most likely to occur when either you failed to collect some information or you just, you couldn't. There is some other like, you know, part of, oh, I think they had an example of like where the effectiveness of a drug depends on like the mood of the person. And so you don't know that when they took the, you know, they were really depressed when they took the drug and you weren't really collecting that. And actually when you talk to them, they're happy, but for most of the time they were depressed or something like that. And that's like actually impacting the outcome. And there's just no way, or at least you don't capture that. Um, and so cleaning the data is not going to get you there. It's stuff that you just didn't don't know. It's not there. Um, uh, and collecting more of the same fuzzy data won't even help because the data is just, it's missing information. But um if you were talking about data in general there are things you can do to data sets to improve them so if you do have a lot of error it is usually advisable to bring additional information in if you can from other sources which uh, i believe is part of what the question was asking but yeah it's entirely right if the error is really really high it's going to be a lot harder to model right and yeah um yeah bringing data in like uh, other data not not more rows more columns i mean also more rows but you know new 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 information and finding ways to learn more about what we we have is what you know like there i don't think the technique whether it's flexible or inflexible is the problem it's the data collection it's you got to figure out more to do to get a model that's going to work okay all right so now i'm going to move on and i think this is a good place for us to talk about ryan's question because they talk about whether each scenario, uh, whether we're interested in inference or prediction. And I think exactly on what he was saying is they often in this chapter say, you know, imply that it's one or the other. You care about um, figuring out what, you know, what the CEO salary is um, or understanding the factors. And often it's both. You want to know what factors affect it so that you can change those to change to make a better prediction um but here you know they say we want to understand the factors and so i take that as a sign of what we really care about is the inference like we want to know what of what affects it not necessarily what the number will be does that resonate yes i think that's <laughs> right and this is probably a regression problem Yes, because we're looking at predicting a number from other from other things, not predicting a class. Um, this is an example that sometimes it's tempting to create a class out of a regression, but just generally, that's generally a bad idea. We'll probably talk about that a lot better of, or a lot more predicting, is the salary going to be high or low? Well, if you've already got it as a number, like models are probably going to be better if you keep it as um, as a number. And then, okay, N is 500. And um, we've got profit, number of employees, and industry as our predictors on CEO salary as the uh, response variable. All right, so the next one, we're looking at launching a new product and wish to know whether it will be a success or failure. 
Um, we collect data on 20 similar products that were previously launched. For each product, we have recorded whether it was success or failure, price charge for the product, marketing budget, competition price, and 10 other variables. And actually, this is the one I think I made, might have even, yeah, I made a note that this one feels a lot like Ryan's question. Like, yeah, uh, technically, we want to know, is it a success or failure? And we're just going to put it into a bucket, success or failure. So what we care about is prediction. But in the real world, you're there, you know, there's very little chance that you're not going to want to look at, okay, but why? So what, what's... This, this raises, like for a model like this, I'm curious as to whether you can, it seems like this is kind of simple enough model. You have like an N of 20 and, you know, there's a few P, right? It's like uh, yep. price charge. There's like- Well, and 13, other variables. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. okay. So, but it's- <laughs> It seems like, you know, you want to know whether your product's going to be a success or failure. And so you put into the input of your model, like the price you're going to charge. And if, you know, <laughs> right. if you run the model and it comes out to be a failure, <laughs> you're not going to launch it with that. You're going to change right. the price and then rerun the model. So it, it seems like with a small enough model, well, that you can run it over and over again. Okay. Like some of the things you can change and some you can't, right? Right. Price you can't change the price you're charging you can change so you can you can run this model though for lots of different inputs even if it's like a, a super black boxy model and get the outputs and start to understand like oh no when the price goes from here to there our, you know our it flops and right. so you can you can it seems that you can use even a black box to do inference if you're willing to just evaluate it at enough points like I, I, this is this is maybe an example of that. Um, yeah, and I'm, I assume we will probably look at some examples of that later. But yes, like this is one where you, technically what you're what they talk about is you're building a prediction model. But clearly, if this is for your own product, you want to know like what what matters is it the right. price? Is it the marketing? What can I do? And you know, is it one of these ten other variables? What can I do to make my product a success? Like you would certainly care about inference. Um, unless, oh yeah, no, it says we are considering launching a new product. Not um, like we're, we're considering investing in a new product. Because <laughs> if, you know, in that case, you might be wanting to run through a ton of products and just choose which ones are going to, are likely to be success based on what you know. Right. This one, but it looks like you have control over some of the dials. <laughs> right. Yep. Any other thoughts on that? Did that did that did that help, Ryan? Yeah, you know it's it's interesting. Um, I, I, the responses in the chat to that question were about what I expected, which was kind of this idea that sure maybe th that there is some kind of overlap between uh, interpretability and prediction, and and so that was encouraging. Um, and then also just talking through these examples as well, which I think we're, we're hearing the same story. Um, what helped me also to sleep better at night uh, about <laughs> them, about them being completely separate was the idea that you can quantify, you can quantify the predictability of it without knowing the interpretability. And there were, you know, there were some questions or some sections of the book that talked about that, those, uh, those equations in particular, like, the number of times that you're, uh, what is it like the measuring the quality of fit was one way. And then the other one was with the, with the classification, being able to say like, I got this percentage correct, uh, classification, whatever that one's called, indicator variables and, and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, but the, the point, I guess what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying with all of that is that even if it came down to it, I can take some, some confidence that I have calculated the success, the measure of fit, or the, the successful prediction rate using a method that's broadly accepted um, in the, say, in the industry or whatever, and be able to, to say, yes, this is, this is predicting correctly without necessarily knowing the, the inputs. So there's a standard there. Yeah, and you know there are cases where, well, um, one of the projects that Jonathan and I are working on right now with, like, has to do with tagging content, 
And we want to automate this system. We want to do what a content expert would normally do. Um, and we have certain input information and we can't really change that input information. Like we have what we have and we just want a model that works. And I don't care how it works as long as it works. Like that is a case where I don't really care about the inference side of it pretty much at all. Now, I, there's a little bit of an asterisk because maybe we can change some, some processes upstream to make it work easier. But for the most part, we just want it to work. Um, versus, you know, a lot of other things that we uh, work on, like we have kind of the other extreme where we're trying to understand, um, you know, things about students and our content. And uh, like, we want to understand what factors are going into students missing questions because we want to know what are they weak in and what can we improve and you know what does this question measure or on the other side what is this question what's bad about this question so um you know that's one where we really do care about the inference kind of not the prediction side almost at all like it's almost purely inference so um but there so I had, so go ahead i had a question related to this uh so if we had just cared about uh, inference side, uh, we would still need some model which is has a good predictability, right? Otherwise, we are not. It's easier to quantify predictability than the whether it's good for inference or not. Is that correct? I think so. Uh, like, are there any yeah. uh, data points which would tell us that it's a good inference model without? knowing it's a good predictive predictive model a good inference model doesn't need to be a good predictive model because you're explaining data rather than trying to predict on it so whilst the two do have components that are desirably comparable when you are trying to explain data like if you're doing a, a scientific experiment you're not necessarily looking to fit the data incredibly well. What you're attempting to do is explain data as well as possible. Just adding a few polynomials into that can actually suddenly make something very difficult to explain if you're trying to put it down into a paper. What you, so, you know, if you want to explain which predictors are having an impact, it's better to get the magnitude of effect. And that's a lot easier to explain when you have something along the lines of a simple linear regression or uh, even multi-level modeling regressions but there's still you know as you go up the chain and add in additional layers of complexity like additional levels or or additional degrees of freedom it becomes increasingly harder to explain which is why to some extent academia does struggle with um with better models of inference particularly as they often don't calculate collect enough data which is often the case in social sciences and certainly from where i came from which is neuroscience I mean, if an inference model does a really bad job at predicting, then it gives you a nice, simple, comforting explanation that is like misleading. Yeah, that, that's what I was asking. Yeah. You could, in, like if it's kind of, if it's consistently directionally wrong, like, you know, wrong in a predictable way, then, um, it can still be good for inference. Like, you know, you know, well, and I'm trying to think of a good example, like- The best um, way to look at, sorry, the best way to, go ahead. to look at an inference model is generally to use a Bayesian method rather than to use like, say, you know, when we're trying to create a predictive model, something like cross-validation works really well at producing a good model for predicting the future. Because we are still trying to um, measure um, the functional, um, uh, the function. But what we're really trying to do is capture the, um, the, uh, the kind of uh, effects within the population. And so when you use Bayesian approach, you can actually tend to do a lot more simulation and capture a lot more information about the error terms instead. And that way it tends to be a bit better at predicting future performance from that side of things, rather than when we're looking at um, predicting future values. Yes, you can do something about cross-validation, but it doesn't necessarily always explain your data in the right way. I mean, it's not it's not an approach that I ever used when I was in academia. Um, maybe someone else has used it differently.
I think the only another thing to think about is if you're modeling something really complicated. So I, I do stuff in, in psychology, and if you're trying to to predict who is going to be depressed, good luck because it's such a complicated beast. But you can see individual predictors that do shift the probability up or down some, even if the overall quality of the prediction stinks. So you get some targets that you can try and move around that you, again, with really complicated things, you know that the, the quality of the predictions is just not going to be good. Okay, cool. And then, um, yeah, this one uh, had, I don't know, I think the only real kind of trick here is that it's weekly. And so that means that there are 52 if you're looking at a year. Um, but so not going to dig into that exercise. So here I don't have a sketch. Um, it's provide a sketch of um, squared variant or squared bias variance, training error, test error, and um, Bayes or irreducible error. Um, I don't know if anyone has a uh, sketch they are they would like to share. That would be great. But the various idea or the general idea is as, as your fl flexibility goes up. Um, you know, we've saw, seen a couple or a few plots showing that bias goes down, um, kind of like by definition, or not really by definition, but by what we've been really digging into, that the more flexible, um, you're more able to fit the real, quote unquote, real underlying model. Um, variance goes up as flexibility goes up. Um, if it's too too flexible, it's overfitting to exactly that data set, so it's not going to work on another data set necessarily. Um, and kind of like very similar concept, the training error should be going down because you're fitting to that data, you're tra fitting to your training data. Um, but the testing area error can go up if we're overfitting to that training data with the flexible model. Um, but I do think it was interesting to put the um, the Bayes or irreducible error on the plot to point, you know, just stress the fact that this is this is a property of like the data you have. It is a constant. It doesn't matter what model you put through it. It's irreducible. It is just the error that is there, and you can't do anything about it. And so that that's a straight line on this plot. Does anyone have any? I don't know, any thoughts that this thing, this exercise expired, inspired? All right, and then I think probably, well, we'll see how this goes. But this is just like kind of <laughs> chat about <laughs> some real life applications. <laughs> Let's think about them. So um, take some real life applications for at classification. Just um, des describe the response and predictors. Is the goal of each application inference or prediction? Explain your answer. And um, I would love people to just kind of chime in with a couple of examples. Uh, Ryan Metcalf, I know you want to. Uh, I'm, I'm salivating at this, this uh, question, John. So, all right, one of the real world examples I'm dealing with at the moment, I've got two IoT devices, both related to GPS. I've got 12 to 14 data points for each device. The idea is to compare the two and find out which of the devices are in error with each other. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually wrangling my brain here trying to figure out how to apply this particular uh, statistical modeling around this idea with these 28 data points. Um, I have a access to probably an additional 18 points that are like combined data. Um, would anybody like to share <laughs> any ideas of how to deal with, with geospatial data without using a map? We're just dealing with, with just data processing in general. So do you have lat long? Yes. So the, the idea, that's a great question, Raymond. The idea would be I'm looking at uh, a, a similar lat lawn, there's about eight feet between each data point, yeah, the antennas themselves. 
uh, but they're tracking along with each other. And all of a sudden one GPS just goes bonkers, right? It just goes brain dead and starts, you know, generating a bunch of gibberish. It's at that moment that I would like to point at, okay, now we've got a problem. It's, it's so far off. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's normal mathematics that it's not even happy anymore. Is that a bad antenna? Is that a bad module, it, a, a IoT device? Um, the other one's perfectly fine. So, or better yet, to throw in another variable to this thought process, I go into a tunnel. I don't have access to the constellation anymore. So therefore it would be implied that both data points are going to be generating gibberish. As long as they both compare to each other, we're good. It's when one is off kilter and the other one is normal, that's when we wanna start flagging things. And the prediction model that I'm, I'm working towards on this, I'm, I'm looking at regression as a possibility, I'm looking at k-mean squared as a possibility. I'm, look, I'm wanting to figure out the relationship between these two devices and when one is not matching the other. That's really what this question is trying to answer or, or the algorithm I'm working towards is trying to answer. Um, I think for me that, that there's too much to think about to have a, a good answer on that. That would be Agreed. great to, to chat about. Um, that, that's one that might be better for some asynchronous, um, thinking time. It is. Um, but yeah, I'll just throw that out there. Uh, yeah. let me, I'll, I'll post it in the, I'll post it in the chat. Uh, Gustavo is on our, uh, GG plot uh, book club and him and I are going back and forth on this subject, <laughs> but uh, I am always welcome for any critique or any input from others uh, in relation to this topic. So, sorry, but if you if you know the velocity of the movement, you can already kind of predict the next distance or draw a circle where it should be, unless you have a very varying speed. At yeah, so time step. So predict, uh, like, compare it to itself to put yeah. it into a, you know, haywire category or not. And then if both of them are haywire, then it's not haywire. That's a good point. Yeah, uh, I, I completely comprehend <laughs> exactly what that implies. Uh, let me give that a shot. And <laughs> Stram, do you have a problem if I if I ping you or or, or talk on Slack on this subject? No problem. My subject is uh, spatial data, so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's perfect. All right. Thank, Thank you, John. All right. Um, Shamsuddin pointed out um, one of the classic classification problems of email spam classification. Uh, that that is, you know, that is definitely a classification problem. Um, the response is uh, spam or not, and then predictors are lots of things, um, mainly the text, but you know, you've got things about the subject, you could have things about the, uh, the headers in the email. Um, and that is one where your goal is pretty purely prediction. Like you're not trying to, I mean, I guess it depends actually. <laughs> your goal, if you're like Gmail, is prediction. Your goal, if you are a spammer, is inference because you want to know why is it getting flagged as spam. Um, so again, I guess every problem can um, be on a continuum. Um, so regarding these questions, uh, um, as John said, the predictors are not only the text, um, but some parameters in the table. Um, now with like contextual modeling, um, embedded like every part of the text matters in terms of predicting the uh, whether it is email spam. So can we say that the whole text is a predictor here because of the contextual relationship between different part of this text? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I am sure that the, actually something happened recently. I've heard, I've seen it, and I've heard other people talking about that um, spam has been getting through on Gmail. And that hasn't happened in a very long time. Um, yes, I am struggling since last two weeks. Yeah, so a lot of spam on Gmail. Either the spammers figured something out, or Gmail broke something. Um, <laughs> and so, 
but yeah, there are lots of things like, you know, uh, there's on the spam thing. One of the interesting things is apparently the most successful spam um, you like, there's a certain level of you want it to be obvious so that the people responding to it are suckers because you don't want to waste your time on smart people. And so, or people who are likely to figure out your scam, at least on more like phishing level things. So some of them, like they will purposefully put in typos because that's a sign to some people that it's bad and it's not a sign to other people. And I just think that was really interesting to hear um, that is something that comes into play in, the, in it. That, But then that, you know, so maybe your spam detector is going to start looking for typos, but of course everyone makes typos. So you can't, you got to have a certain balance there. Um, but yeah, there are lots of things that go into the models for sure. And apparently um, someone has been making their inferential models on the Gmail uh, spam detectors because they're, they're getting through. All right. Um, anyone else have examples for classification or shall we move on? I've got an example which kind of covers all three. All right. Okay. Uh, so this is actually a problem that I dealt with a while ago, which is uh, in demand forecasting. So um, say you've got, you know, in a supermarket, you've got a lot of items and you need to kind of uh, compare them all together, but also in order to do different kinds of analysis on them. So the first thing you would want to do is you want to cluster them together because sometimes product groupings don't really work. Sometimes what you want to do is, for instance, similar flavored products that are in different categories, but overlap in, in their action. So you've got a big enough data set. What you can do is you can cluster those together. And those clusters you can use as, um, as ways or like themes for the same thing. So when you create a product, you can create uh, themes uh, through NLP. And it's just basically another way of clustering. And then what you can do is with that data, you can then predict or classify by using that information for future for other products, because you can predict uh, new products coming in, there are similar features, similar information, and you can do that to classify anything else that's coming in there. And then once you've got those, you can then um, choose which items you want to do, say for instance, panel regression on. With, so they'll want to, you'll want to have everything within the same classified or cluster uh, classification, which has come from your cluster analysis. And then you can do a panel regression on that and you can use that to ensemble with a nested uh, regression forecasting and thereby improve the ability of your products to both capture individual forecasts whilst also accounting for cross-affecting sales. Very cool. That was, yes. <laughs> that is a very cool example. And, uh, I'm sorry, but I didn't notice the time that you know we've got some people notice or pointing out. Yeah, that we need to take off. Um, we'll talk in the channel about what we're going to do next week. Like we could keep going through exercises. I think we just kind of we hit a we hit our stride just as we're ending the meeting, and I think it could be interesting to do another week on these. So we'll talk about whether we want to do that, whether we want to talk about them in the chat. Um, we'll decide that in the channel. Uh, but yeah. I will see you all next week for something. <laughs> we'll figure that out. Stop the share. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.